Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. I'm Tom Ray, and on today's show, I talk with a band based out of New York. They're called Onesie. And first of all, hopefully this video turns out well. It's really, I've got a new recording system that I use, and supposedly it fixes the problem we had. He was in a park, so you'll hear like kids screaming in the background, which is kind of funny. But what it does is it's supposed to record on both ends and then upload it so it should be a seamless recording. We had tons of disconnection issues, so we'll see if that happened while we were recording and if I had to edit it, so if it gets choppy, whatever. If it doesn't, then it worked out perfectly and kudos to the Riverside software that runs this podcast. Anyway, that's aside from the fact, I'm just preparing you for the fact that it might be a fun little journey on this episode. But uh, they're a great band. They release, so, uh, they've released some music recently, an album recently. There you go. That's what I was trying to say. And uh, it's just fantastic music. They tour. They have records that they put out, uh, merch and other stuff that they do. But uh, I get into a conversation about the fact that the person is running their own uh, practice space, a building that they rent out for practice spaces. And I was kind of fascinated by that. So we talk about that a little bit, talk about music, talk about writing, talk about all kinds of stuff. So here's that interview starting right now and hopefully it doesn't chop up. My name is Ben. I am the primary songwriter, guitar player, singer in a project called Onesie based in Brooklyn, New York, where we're at right now. And uh, yeah. All right. So you're in Onesie mm -hmm. and I heard about you from another band that I spoke to out of New York, uh, yep. Safety Meeting. I, I was asking them, yes. I was asking Keith after the fact, I'm like, uh, yeah. hey, what are some other bands I should talk to? And you're one of the bands that he mentioned. Also, you're one of the bands that responded when I said, hey, do you want to be on the podcast? <laughs> there you go. We're in the Venn diagram. So first of all, yeah. how long has yeah. Onesie been together? Onesie, I guess I, the first record came out in 2017, and I've probably been writing songs as this entity since 2013 or 14 or so. Um, okay. So yeah, about 10 years as, as Were you a in bands before project. that? Oh, yeah, tons. In fact, I kind of started where Safety Meeting is from. Um, I went to college in Albany, and they're based in Saratoga. And so, yeah, weirdly enough, I, li I lived in Albany for five oh. years. Didn't know those guys back then. I think they're a bit younger. But um, I was in a, a band in Albany all those years. Toured a decent amount. Uh, got pretty engrossed in the punk scene there and met people you know, all around the country and eventually the world uh, through that. Moved to Brooklyn, um, you know, basically after I graduated. It was essentially a college band. And so I kind of moved back to where I'm from. I'm actually from Queens and Long Island. So this is kind of back, back to my roots a bit. Uh, here and I've lived here for 24 years since then. Oh, um, yeah. Um, but the whole time I've been playing music, I mean, I did bands in high school too on Long Island, none of, none of them really did that much, just played locally. But, um, okay, yeah, the Disenchanted was the Albany band, and that band toured a decent amount and played tons in the kind of tri state area. Um, and so yeah, it's been, it's you know, this is uh, something is not, is not new to me. <laughs> I've been doing it the whole right. time, and I, onesie is definitely like my most me thing it's basically the point when i decided that i wanted to kind of write songs by myself and have it be you know a bedroom songwriting project but when it's played live it's played with friends and it's very loud and much more intense than anything that i would come up with just by myself in my bedroom yeah so the, the live band is kind of you know like we're i think when we write and arrange in the room it's all it's all pretty equal i'm, I'm bringing the song and i'm bringing the demo for everyone to kind of slice up but okay um yeah, everyone, everyone kind of brings their influences and, and their two cents for sure. And pretty much everyone comes from a, most of the people I play with tend to come from a similar kind of background, DIY, punk, hardcore. Okay. It, it, I was yeah. going to ask about the writing. So are you recording it? Yeah. Like, like, are you multi-tracking or is it really just like, hey, I played a thing like this and it goes like this. Let's write something to it. Like, no, what I is do, the process for I'm, when you're doing that kind I of do stuff? Extreme, I do extremely fleshed out demos. So I'm really presenting every piece of instrumentation including the you know drums bass guitar keyboards, okay. vocals, harmonies every everything's pretty much done but that doesn't mean the song will 
stay that way or survive at all. I mean, the first thing I would usually say is like, do we like this song in general? And if so, do we want to continue to work on it? Um, and it's, you know, it's usually pretty obvious, like, especially in the beginning of a sort of songwriting right. cycle. Yeah, no, very much the same over here on my end too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I you agree. Do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, you have the tools to do that now so easily with drum programming, especially for rock music. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much, you know, um, eke out a, a, a similar beat. One, one thing that's actually really changed the game lately is actually not doing it that way. And if you work with a drummer that you really like, our current drummer, Jason, is fantastic. And I really, we did one session together and I, I think I got like four or five songs out of it, out of like a couple hours for recording work. Just at the demo level, getting a sort of like um, uh, high energy drum performance allows you to kind of get in the hypnosis you need to imagine this song being completed. You know, and I'm not, I'm yeah. not making the completed song yet. I'm really just, because uh, hopefully we'll go to like something a little more hi-fi than what I can do in my in my house. Although sometimes it gets close. Um, yeah, that live mm -hmm. drum performance really helps. But even if there isn't live drums, I can kind of just have enough of a, a enough program drums to get the point across to other people. Um, yeah, and those yeah. demos are nice. Everyone summers suffers from demo itis too, which is like you go back and you listen to that original demo and you're like, oh, there's a magic there that I wish kind of translated yes. to the final version that I does know. happen sometimes but the, the important thing is just don't ever listen to that demo ever again <laughs> you know well, once, what we do i want other people do. to be involved yeah and yeah. well what we do is we actually work constantly in the daw together mm -hmm. so exactly. it's yep. uh, yeah and we're able to bring that home take that home with each other share the we're able to share our sessions oh, your, your collaborators all, all work together in the daw yes Yep, so yep. when we get that, that original is always there. And if we try to replace right. it and it doesn't get there, we can always revert back to using the track that did have totally. that. But, you know, I, I we will the slow way things. where I export the one. Oh, man, that solo was so good. I'll export it and then try and drop it in the new one. But the problem is if you've shifted it a few BPMs mm -hmm. or it's a little out of tune or something, it, it can be a little problematic to do that. But I've done that tons of times where I've just. Yeah, it's like the thing is, when you're when you're recording in your bedroom or whatever, you might be running through eight pedals that you're never going to get that exact, you know, swoosh effect again. So, yes, it's good to <laughs> you gotta take a picture of it or something. Yeah, uh, but I kind of I kind of like being in the moment, too. And if the second version uh, is different, that's fine. So be it. It should be it should be judged on its own merit. Yeah. Yeah. And the other part too is sometimes with the being able to record things you want and tell me if you run into this. So do you write for the arrangement or do you not think about it until mm. after the fact and go, shit, how are we going to, how are we going to cover these parts? Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Do I, right. Do, like is the instrumentation covered and what we could pull off live? Yeah. There's a right. lot of keyboard parts that we just don't do. Uh, I try, I'll translate them to guitars. Like if I have like a layer of orchestration or, um, extra percussion or something we figure it out and i think that's okay like it's not like guns and roses got better on the user illusion tour when they had 20 people <laughs> on stage you know people... <laughs> so i'm i'm happy to be in a two guitar band <laughs> i'm happy to be in a two guitar band that um can approximate what i've what i've demoed and what we've later recorded in the final version usually that works out yeah. okay and i've been and the other thing is like you know traveling in a minivan or something like we do what am i i can't fit that many people uh, so, and look, even organizing a practice or a photo shoot is like impossible even for, for your four people, let alone five. So I, yeah, I just, I try to cover it the best we can. There's a lot of sort of like picking up a shaker and dropping it and grabbing mm -hmm. the guitar. It used to play, I used to have a keyboard live too, but I just, I don't know, it's dragging around a Nord everywhere. just got to be problematic after a while. So yeah, it's yeah, two guitars now. Two it keyboards. also depends. <laughs> Oh, you do? And you're, oh, really? Oh, my God. Well, I guitars? play one and our guitar player plays ones. Uh, so we're, we're, we're four piece, but we're multi instrumental. So I love it. But that's, that's a, that setup has got to take at least 18 to 20 minutes. You know, you got to get out oh, yeah. seven minutes. <laughs> yep. But yet the yeah. drummer is still the one that takes the longest to set up. <laughs> what's, what's, so we got that where, going for us. What, what city? Are you, are you, I'm sorry, I, don't, I don't know if you're in this. Where are you based? Uh, based in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, Madison. Love it. Bought the favorite yeah. jacket of, that I ever owned in my life there. Oh, really? What is it? At a, at a, I played a basement show there in maybe 99, 2000. Okay. And uh, there was just an amazing thrift store. And I was looking for kind of mod um, uh, uh, like a jacket with the orange interior and the furry hood. Mm -hmm. What is that called? Parka. 
yeah, yeah. just like a really classic parka um that to me looked like something that who would have worn and i found one at this thrift store in madison and i literally had like six years later someone was like you gotta throw this thing away dude it looks insane it's so dirty it's so terrible <laughs> and uh, i wore it yeah i wore it constantly and i always remember madison for delivering the goods on that we played with so a, a pretty big uh emo band there i think they're from there seven days of samsara was their name um, okay. And they were awesome. They were awesome. They tour. I, we played with them when they toured the East Coast too. Yeah, late nineties. But no, I love Madison. Was a wonderful place. College town, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, during awesome. that time period, there were more places to play. Right now, live shows yeah. is a very different thing here. We've kind of been overtaken by Live Nation. They took over yeah. one of the big promoters here, so it's a lot more difficult to actually get shows in a lot of the clubs. But you said you played in at a basement show. And it was, and that's, I think, more desirable. I mean, yeah, I'm a little biased. I actually don't drink. So, like, whenever I'm in a situation that is a VFW or an all-ages thing, um, I much prefer that to a bar, hmm. you know, trying to get people out to a bar. And, yeah. Uh, we, okay. we, we recently, maybe, like, uh, in January, actually right around the time that we played with um, with Safety Meeting on this little tour, we wound up doing an all-ages show in a town called New Paltz. In New York, mm -hmm. and it was like I hadn't seen anything like that in so many years, and it was so wonderful. Just you know, uh, 100, 150 kids just going nuts, did, yeah. did not care about alcohol, and yeah, I miss that. I mean, living in New York City, it's all it's all bars pretty much. So right, yeah, but is, you guys also have the ability to play out a lot. Here, it's like you know, maybe right. you can play once a month or two twice a month. Uh, totally. Out there, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you're able to play out all the time. Yeah, there's diminishing returns if you play the city a lot. It's not like it's not like live rock music is um, the coolest thing to go do anywhere at this point. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. We're definitely in competition with DJ nights and all that stuff that draw way more. Mm. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, of course. There's, I mean, and there's like 30 venues like uh, within an eight mile radius here. So yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, more options, and certainly I can understand that Madison. You've got two options <laughs> come Friday, right. Saturday. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. and Thursday too, because it's a college town. Thursday is the night that all the college right. kids go, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to go to class tomorrow. So they go out on okay. Thursday nights. That's <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah, I love, I prefer Thursday anyway. Yeah. It's like the, uh, don't under, don't underestimate it. Right. <laughs> now, as far as the music goes, and uh, you said you've toured with safety meeting and you've done different yeah. tours. First of all, I've seen different descriptions that you have of your band, and I love all the descriptions that you have, first of all. But how would you define your music if people were to go, what kind of... I know this is the dreaded mm. question, but what, you know, what do you categorize your music as? I, I mean, we usually, we, we've done well in the sort of power pop overall category, only because it's loud guitars, pretty concise arrangements, and pounding drums catchy bass lines like it's 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 not like rocket science but I, we also get like tagged as obtuse a little weird and kind of add at times meaning like the song obtuse kind of obtuse just because the song can kind of shift and go in different directions oh okay uh, at, at any given time yeah which is intentional which is definitely just my inability to focus on one thing for too long like oh usually um throwing a curveball uh when okay. arranging a song um so yeah i would say i would say we say heavy power pop just because not only do we actually tune down a half step, but it just has a sort of like, has a sort of hammer effect to it. Maybe that doesn't translate on all the recordings in quite the same way, but live it's definitely intense and, and loud. So mm -hmm. yeah, heavy power pop. And you know, if I had to give like a couple band references, I would say, you know, Thin Lizzy, Big Star, Pavement, wearing mm -hmm. a hat. Um, uh, yeah, kind of like, I mean, the, Having grown up in the 90s, my, I think my palette of tools is kind of cemented there. So I kind of grew up like shredding on guitar first, then sort of downgrading to punk. And now I'm sort of in the middle somewhere where like, I really put the song first, but the tools that I'm using are generally, you know, clean guitars, loud guitars, um, yelly, weird vocals, um, but still melodic. Yeah. So I, yeah, somewhere in that zone. We get compared to Dinosaur Jr. every once in a while, too. Um, yeah, people say all kinds, it really depends. Cause there's, there's like four or five different kind of modes that we operate in and on record, it's even, it's more varied. So one, you know, one review will be completely different than the next. It's really hard to say, but yeah. Okay. Yep. 
And first of all, I realized I meant to ask this earlier. Uh, you had talked about the when you are able to practice together in, mm -hmm. as a band. Uh, where do you practice? How how like do you guys have a studio set up? Do you have a practice space? Like how are you getting together? Yeah, I actually run a practice space in a neighborhood called Greenpoint. Me, I was meeting oh. one room, one room within a, a facility. Um, so okay. the facility is called Sci Labs. They have two different locations. Greenpoint is actually a pretty gentrified neighborhood. I used to live there. Don't live there anymore. But I kept a space uh -huh. there. Um, and I managed maybe like it's shared between five different entities, you know, whether they're bands or individuals. So really? we all kind of have a designated time and we share a Google calendar and just pencil in when we want to go in. So like, say for us, for onesie, we, our new time is we switch from Wednesdays to Tuesdays, but we probably really only use maybe like 60, 70 percent of those Tuesdays. And then otherwise I might grab a practice on a weekend or something. And that, that's generally how now most is, of the bands that are consistent do that in New York. You, you basically have a monthly practice space. If you want to leave, it's just 30 days notice. But it's not like mm -hmm. you're renting by the hour, per se. I mean, some bands do that. But if you're going to be if you're in a band that's kind of going and chugging and you're touring and making records and, and uh, prepping to record, you kind of want a consistent pace, a, a space to store your gear in anyway. Okay. Yeah. Now, he, so did you rent this space specifically to rent it out to people did you lease the space like how i i'm i'm kind of curious about this uh well, the, the i, I, I would kind be, of like that idea it's a great idea well it's a great business to be honest with you because there's so many people in bands in new york yeah it's like a resource that we need and and real estate is so expensive here that if someone happens to get a building that they can convert into practice spaces and then kind of pass that savings on to uh, artists, that's always a great thing. And there's been a lot of, there's actually mm -hmm. like a pretty decent amount of choice here. So the setup would be someone like owns or runs the building, or they say they have a 10 year lease on a building. They build 30 spaces, mm -hmm. say, in a kind of big open um, floor, soundproof those. And then each one of those spaces, you know, you can rent to whoever, but if the rent is say 1200 bucks a month, you're generally gonna wanna have some roommates, you know, or you know, space mates essentially. So everyone kind of tailors mm -hmm. it to whatever they need. So for me, for example, I don't really need it that often. Um, like I said, maybe maybe three times a month. So to me, it's it's mm -hmm. more of a better situation for me to run it as a sort of you know landlord. And basically, mm -hmm. bands pay me rent, and then I pay the full rent to the person that owns the building or is renting the building, whatever has a lease for ten years, whatever on the building. So mm -hmm. yeah, that works out pretty well. And and like I said, I I don't like the hourly spaces because you go in there and you just have to plug into their gear and you're in and out in two right. hours. It doesn't feel very comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, this is like a second. And you home. don't provide. Uh, yeah. yeah. It no, I really yeah. I really like that idea, and I've kind of been workshopping that idea to tell you the yeah. truth. And you, you uh, in wasn't a house really or entirely I mean, a lot sure of people just practice, how to go about it. A lot of people it. just practice in a in a house, right? You could just do a basement. Yeah. Well, we actually have, we're in a warehouse right now that is currently broken up into different spaces. Uh, yep. but we, we don't have as much control over when and you know, when and how we can use it, uh, during right. different, like basically we have, we can do stuff there after 9 PM. That's about it. Uh, gotcha. okay. you know, which is fine for us, but yep. I'd like to do more other things and like, you know, my business that I run out of my home and this podcast here, yeah. I'd like to also do that during the day, but I can't really get out there because there's, it, it's not soundproofed where we are. <laughs> so if I'm doing the soundcast, totally. there's going to be like yeah. violin lessons going on next door, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. You run into that problem when you're say tracking vocals or something in this space. And then it's, you know, mm -hmm. you're in the middle of an amazing vocal take and all of a sudden the heavy metal drummer starts destroying the China symbol you know next door and then it's you know your take is destroyed so <laughs> you know you use it for what you can you I, I usually do if i'm doing the vocals which you know i've kind of gone away from that i usually prefer to do them in a in a real studio with a good mic and a, and a decent engineer and blah 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 but if you're going to do them at home mm -hmm. you cannot have si sirens and amps and all that stuff around you it's pretty tough to find that in new york i'd never be able to do them at home i'm never comfortable doing vocals at home even if i have the entire house to myself I still even with I just, another I person engineering. Um, I I just need to be in a different area. I'm just saying I'm not comfortable doing the vocals at right. home. It feels weird. 
totally. totally. <laughs> well, you know, I, you, I, you, have I like, just feel... you have your family around or something. It's tough. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I really like that. That's really cool to hear that. That's what you've done with the practice space. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay. So, so enough yeah. about my curiosity about, about running a place. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now tell me about, there's a video that you have that you released mm -hmm. for one of your more recent songs and it's called uh uh what you kill wait <laughs> i have my notes written down but i don't have them separated mm -hmm. what you kill how made who made you god damn it i wrote the notes wrong but anyway you know <laughs> what song i'm talking about right <laughs> i think it's just is it just what you kill yes probably yeah. i seriously I know, wrote I down the song. note to make sure to ask you about this video and i wrote a nonsense incoherent sentence that has it in there somewhere and i can't make out the way that i wrote it just because i wanted to remember the name of the video properly which worked out splendidly ah. didn't it um anyway you know what video i'm talking the one with the tv yeah. head that talks yeah. <laughs> yep 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 right tell me about that <laughs> yeah i mean so that that came out um it was like a year and a month ago or so yeah about 13 months ago um, well, the song itself was a bit of a, I wanted to challenge myself to write something really simple and straightforward. Okay. Um, it has a long outro, but otherwise it's kind of just a pounding, almost kind of post-punk kind of song. And I love that stuff, but it, I tend to be more noodly, uh, when I'm writing riffs and, and writing songs. Oh. So that was a great exercise just to keep it really simple. Just a couple chords. It has a menacing bass line, but the cordial changes are just really simple in the verse and chorus. And, um, you know, it worked because it's like the one song that we never cut from our set. It's really great to drive uh, a set. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the video, the video itself, I had seen, um, I had seen um, a video for the singer of this band, Chastity Belt. And I'm, her okay. name is escaping me right now. But... Um, the video was incredible. It's just this totally psychedelic animation. And I happened to just Google um, who made it. Because I was just, you know, whenever, hmm. whenever it comes time to make a video, as you probably know, your options are like try to arrange something locally with your bandmates and film something in a park, whatever it is. Like you try to come up with some like interesting concept that would be worth listening. Or you could just completely outsource it to someone's imagination. And I thought yeah. for the first one, I was more comfortable with, you know, we, it was our first song back after like three or four years of COVID. I just didn't want to put a lot of energy towards the video itself. And I didn't want to make it about my, you know, myself or any other people in the band. I just wanted something, a piece of mm -hmm. art that could kind of stand on its own. And the director's name, I, I haven't thought about his name in a while, but I think it's Air 2, if I'm remembering how to pronounce it correctly. Um, he was great. He was just, I, yeah, just, I, I wish I, I wish I would have just yeah. remembered to keep the tab open with the video on it that has the correct name and the information wanna, on it so yeah, I could help. I could, I could open it right now. Um, we did our, we did a collaboration uh, completely over uh, DM on Instagram. And he said, yeah, he's like, here's what oh. it costs. We kind of negotiated the costs and something that I could afford. Okay. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can make like a minute, minute and a half of, of footage and we'll just find like a way to kind of make it work with the song. Yeah, And we just went back and forth with the concept for a few weeks. And I'm a sucker for the TV on the human head thing. I just feel like I was like, when I first started getting into music, I, I would just draw that in my notebook, like in the 90s. And uh, yeah. so <laughs> I think he came up with that himself where he had, he might have just had it lying around for something he was doing already. And hmm. uh, we kind of chiseled out a bit of a timeline. And it came out, I just love the way it came out. It's like one yeah. of those collaborations that can only happen you know, when it's two different people in two completely different situations on different continents. Um, yeah. Oh, he's so in he, a different continent? Oh, he's in Europe. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't catch that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's in um, Budapest? Remember that right? I have to double check that. Wow. But they were going, yeah, in Hungary. He's in Budapest. And they were basically going through, who's the guy that's in power there? They were basically going through a crazy situation where inflation was so high that he didn't want me to pay him at first because it would have just been lost in the in the in the uh, uh, in the, in the transfer. So I paid him a big yeah. point. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, the, just his life just sounded so utterly different than mine. But then we kind of talked about music and what we liked in movies and stuff, and it's great to like you kind of realize wow. that that universal language of art 
whatever right. film, motion, music, it's all very much the same. And it's not, you know, I toured Europe plenty of times, been to Europe plenty of times, and I found Oh, you already. have? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And not in onesie, no, but in other previous bands, yeah. Really? But, yeah. But, like, yeah, it was just nice to be reminded uh, of that. And, it, yeah, it came out amazing. And really, it was just, I mean, to actually do it completely through Instagram, I, at first I was sort of like, I don't want to use this as my collaboration tool. Mm -hmm. um, but I really, it just really didn't matter what it was. We could have been pen pals, you know. Yeah. It, what really mattered is that he was making awesome art and he enjoyed the music and we made something great together. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it kind of lightened, lightened up my attitude a bit with collaboration. I think you kind of get used to, at least locally in New York, you know, you have your kind of known quantities of people that could, you could work on stuff with and everyone's awesome, but it's really good to just take a chance on something. If you see something you like, just contact that person and try to, whatever it is, like, hey, do you want to play a part on this record or do you want to make a video or do you want to play a show mm -hmm. together? Um, any sort of collaboration like that, that will stay with you and fuel you, fuel you yeah. um, during those times when you feel like, oh, I'm just kind of like beating a dead horse, you know, locally. Yeah, right. If you've been at this long enough, you can get those, those, those feelings. Yeah, and I actually yeah. now prefer doing collaboration through some sort of messenger that's on the app that we're using. The only drawback yeah. being is a lot of the times when you first send the message, if the person isn't connected with you, totally, it, it just goes into their message request, which you never get a notification for. Like you'll notice it yep. maybe a month later that you got it. That's, that's a big problem with like uh, press where say if you email an outlet a few times, I know this because we've worked with PR agencies, but I've also just done it myself too. And just like professionally too. Like if you're just trying to get any sort of contact with someone at any entity, yeah, I think you try and email them first. And if you don't hear back there, you try like you maybe DM them on Instagram, but yeah, you never know if you're really getting through. So yeah. What are you going to do? You just, I, 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 you just have to be okay with nothing happening too. Right. Well, and Move the on. other part too is in the messenger, like after a while when I'm emailing questions, it's kind of yeah. like, this would be faster if it was instant response. <laughs> like I'm essentially <laughs> using email as a messenger right now, once you start getting into the conversation. And that's totally. why, that's why the messenger is always better for that. But, uh, you yeah, totally. just, you said, uh, that you have used PR and you've also done it yourself in the past. Now yeah. you also yep. mentioned that you've toured Europe with previous bands and yeah. you currently have a minivan that you tour with now. How yeah. are you booking these shows? Who's doing these for you? I'm curious as far as getting the word out there, finding venues and things like that, who's doing that for you? Well, I tend to, I guess onesie at, at this point is a pretty known quantity. So we get a decent amount of like offers certainly locally and somewhat in the tri-state area okay um our bass player matt has kind of taken it upon himself to book things a little further out so you know whatever's in a reasonable radius like we just played uh philly and dc you know earlier in the year with safety meeting we played you know albany new pulse um jersey we play once in a while i mean really it just has to be semi-drivable i mean having running my own business i have a kid uh, and everyone's sort of own lives. Everyone, you know, most of the people in the band are in multiple projects. Hmm. It's not really realistic to um, say, "Hey, the record came out and let's tour for a month." I mean, we're not gonna. I right. did that in my youth. I I could not do a DIY tour like that. Nor do I care to really cater to a situation that would get me out of DIY tour zone and into something more professional. Just mm -hmm. it's not worth spending my time on. I'd rather just make art, songs, whatever, and get yeah. me out there. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with like a bigger label putting things out but even that doesn't really equate to successful touring at this point that's right. really, if you're going to tour a lot you really gotta hammer it and really you know eat shit for a while <laughs> right. um so yeah so kind of having having done that and had a lot of fun having done that in the past it's really more about you know serving what's what's what makes sense for the particular project um how we're doing it i mean yeah it's just i think the best way to do it is just to have honestly like these documents where we just keep tabs of what we see out there on social media would be the bigger venues in a place we're not familiar with, right? So, yeah. like, if it's something like Philly, I'm fairly familiar with, like, the five or six venues that I know. But there's 30 more that I don't, you know? Mm -hmm. So just figuring out what those are, usually through social media, other bands that have gone to play there, just looking at the connections there, um, you could develop a list pretty quickly. Uh, and that's pretty much what we did. Just really in our spare time, we were able to kind of cobble together these little weekenders. And uh, most of them have been really great overall. Um, yeah. We haven't really experienced a lot of like 
impossibilities. You know, it's if you email 25 venues, probably only two are going to be interested. And that's that's OK. That's just the way it is. But mm-hmm. within those two, if you do it right, you book the right bands, you're probably going to have a pretty decent show if you if you work on it. Uh, and like do I you said, usually I, you couldn't do that 30 days, but for a weekend, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Do yep. you usually come with a companion band? Uh, because that's the other drawback is right. it's trying to find people to play with. Even here locally, uh, that happens totally. to us. It's just like we can get a show, but then it's like, who do we play with? Yeah, the most arduous part of that is booking the bill. The other thing mm-hmm. is like the, the actual bookers at these venues would much prefer that you come at them with a full bill to begin with. So that's yes. taken care of. They might want to tweak it or they might say, well, they're playing there, you know, two weeks before. So find someone else with a slot. But yeah, g- generally you want to come at them with with uh, that already done. And that's done the same way. You're basically just looking around at which bands are playing and doing well. And I guess stylistically, too, you want to find people that are, you know, for us, it's like power pop. We're looking for kind of generally loud guitar rock bands. But we're totally fine playing with people you know, of any genre. And, and ideally, and, you know, this is very important to us, we want those bills to be diverse and not with a, you know, <laughs> a bunch of lame people. Or I mean, I, like, it's impossible to really uh, vet every mm-hmm. single human, but we really try to make it like, okay, you know, we, we seem like we kind of get along with everyone in this bill. And to be honest with you, it's got to be someone that is, you know, uh, not an asshole, not... Um, <laughs> Not a red state, you know, human being in the in the worst way, that kind of stuff. You know, you don't want to be at a show and then suddenly someone's like telling you, yeah, man, blah, 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 blah. I know that's much tougher in today's environment, but um, I would, you know, one of the reasons I pay a lot of money to live in New York is like, I don't want to deal with that shit <laughs> if I don't have to. I, <laughs> I like I like living in the within the walls of my, you know, extremely liberal city. Um, yeah. So if we could, you know, if we could, if we can make sure that it's a safe space for everyone that's there, um, all the better. And again, we're not really venturing that far. Although mm-hmm. recently, recently there's been talk of going to a festival in West Virginia, which I'm sure would be fine. In, really? In yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, festival. Of that, uh, it's called Risers Fest. Huh. I asked like I know anything about festivals, even <laughs> or, or Western. I mean, I don't really. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't played a festival in a while either. Um, yeah, but it, you know, it's that's an example of a place where you'd be kind of be going into. Oh, this is kind of an uncharted sector for us recently. I mean, I I probably played West Virginia in the '90s or early 2000s, maybe once, but yeah, mm-hmm. that's, there's usually not a lot going on. Charles, I guess Charleston would be the place. Yeah, you would play because it's a college town. Yeah, but anyway, point being, um, yeah. If you're going into that zone, make sure it's good. Right. And then as far as the albums that you've recorded and put out, yeah. and you said you've done demos and then shown them to the band, when you actually do produce them as records, are you doing it yourself? Are you going into a studio? How are you guys recording your albums? Or studio. at the very least, the most recent one? Yeah, all of them, of all the three onesie albums, all of them were basically done with the same process of me heavily, heavily demoing 20 songs or so whittling them down mm-hmm. to 12 or 13 and then going into an actual studio and recording them. Um, okay. It's been different for every album. The last one was done um, at uh, Pete Donnelly's studio. He plays in a band called the figs who are an amazing oh. power pop band who have been around for a long time that I first saw on MTV in the, in the mid nineties. And yeah, wait, uh, yeah. Like yeah. from soul coughing. No, so that that's Mike Doherty. I think you're thinking of. Okay, all right, all right. And then <laughs> so Pete of Donnelly, that also made him, me yeah. think of from like Belly or something like that. Only that's a woman. Her Tanya, last name Tanya, is Donnelly. You're thinking of Tanya Donnelly. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Of. I'll go. I'll go ahead. And, anyway, and enough of that. Pizza. Back to your story. <laughs> yeah, Ta- I love right. Belly. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's funny that you mentioned. Um, uh, wait, what was the first band you mentioned? It was. Uh, 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 soul coughing. That guy. So that guy lives in New York, and he's friends with a bunch of people I know. And actually, soul coughing is getting back oh. together with, in a reunion, I think, in, soon. Really, uh, I, awesome. I, I well, thought yeah, they I were there. very much not in speaking terms. I think that that has ended. But okay, all right, they're back. But anyway, interestingly, yeah, he plays in a band called The Figs, and uh, I first saw their video on MTV for a song called "Favorite Shirt," which I loved, and. Hmm. The, the bass that he plays 
in that video is the bass that we used for a lot of the tracks on the onesie record because he still had it and it sounds amazing yeah he's an amazing oh, cool. player and songwriter he has a studio um about an hour and a half north of the city and yeah i just contacted him and we got along great and i said you know can we put together a weekend to do bed tracks there like three days uh did that it, it, definitely a rush i think when you go someplace and you really you want to get 12 songs down and you're kind of doing eight nine hour days you know it's tough to kind of compress it that it's much better to go to a studio mm-hmm. for a week so i just didn't have you know being a new dad i just didn't have that time so then yeah after that came back to brooklyn and went into an overdub studio called at the time it's called it was called uh, sound town uh, which is run by my friend and engineer producer Gary Turio. And basically just do, you know, I usually do overdubs at home, and I did do some at home, but I really wanted this one to be vocals forward, hi-fi, really snappy, and just not dark. I think what winds up happening is when you start mm-hmm. having a home recording element, things get a little muddy, things get a little dark. You know, maybe you're using a cheaper mic at home or the overdubs you're doing at home just don't fit with everything else. Um, and so I, we really focused on that. I yeah. think I did maybe five or six days of vocals and then really cool remote mix. We, we, we might have mixed in person for a day or something or just did some kind of stylistic decisions over a day. But remote mixing is basically when they're sitting at their DAW and you're at your DAW if, if you need it or you're just listening on headphones. And they're just in real time showing you what they're doing. The cool thing about that is that when they're doing stuff sonically, you can chat them. Right. So mm-hmm. instead of leaning on their shoulder and being like the bass needs to come up in the, in at 302 right here, you could just type that to them and it kind of happens in real time. And I found and, you know, it, it, it's a, it was a good covid thing um, Although covid wasn't super an issue at the time that we were doing this. But I think it, a lot of the, a lot of these options came out of that. And um, yeah, doing it that way was fantastic because we we've kind of already done a lot of the major creative decision making. It was, you know, you're recording it when you're mixing a rock band. You just want every song to sound punchy and live and. There were some stylistic things that I had in mind for each song, but not that different from each other. So, yeah, it was maybe three or four days of mixing after five, six, seven days of overdubs. And that was that. Yeah, I got it mastered at Peerless, which mm-hmm. is a place in um, Boston. It's done a lot of awesome big records. All right. And then because – so the recording has been good up until this point, but we're starting to really get choppy. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and that yeah. is what are some things – that you have coming up in the future or some shows. And uh, just so you know, this will probably be coming out in about two weeks, just so cool. you have more of a timeline of what to mention. Yeah. So in uh, Brooklyn, um, we're playing on August 9th, Friday, which is gonna be a single release. Um, it's actually the one song that didn't come out with the album that we recorded with oh. the album called Gift of Gab. Okay. And it's a great song. We just couldn't kind of make it work on the album, but I, I'm psyched to have it come out finally. So we're just going to put it out as a standalone single. Uh, we're playing Main Drag with Grasping Straw, Main Drag Music, which is an awesome store and venue in uh, Williamsburg, mm-hmm. Brooklyn, with uh, Grasping Straws, Sorry Darling, Sorry Darling, and Navel Grazer, um, three awesome bands. And then we are going to do. We're doing a little bit of touring in September. Um, Pretty much, I mean, for the rest of the year, it's probably going to be local shows and writing, but we are going to do some touring in September. I think we're doing uh, Connecticut, uh, Verm- uh, Rhode Island, and hopefully Boston, but maybe Worcester. Just another kind of like quick little weekend thing. Um, okay. Yeah, otherwise, I'll probably, j- you know, I would love to do like some West Coast dates, like fly out and do like a week up and down the coast. Love to do Canada. We're not too far yeah. from there. Love to do some Midwest stuff. Europe, I'd love to get back to. It just kind of depends, you know, where where all of our heads are. At. I think our kind of our kind of lower middle class of bands, you know, we're happy to just do what we can do. And yeah. um, to me, it's more about the quality of the songs first. And if people want to hear more, we'll we'll come and do it. <laughs> okay. And then, yeah. uh, do you have uh, not that you need to release another album, but do you have any plans for another yeah. album coming out anytime soon? Oh yeah, I think the. I'm pretty influenced by like, you know, like guided by voices in this respect, although not that frequently, but this is, I just want to make albums, you know, every two years. I just, yeah. new, new set of songs, put it out. Don't think about it that much. Um, and hopefully at the end of like 10 years, you've got, you know, 15 great songs and then 55 songs that 
maybe aren't great. <laughs> right. right. Uh, but I, I just, I just love it so much. It's just, it's always been a fun process for me since I was a teenager and uh, can't stop writing and recording. Love it. Yeah. Well, cool. I want to thank you yeah. so much for talking with me today. It was great meeting you. Thank you, Tom. This has been awesome. Um, uh, and again, if we ever do this, I'm going to be uh, in, in your house next to your uh, <laughs> Pokemon that you got back there or whatever. <laughs> yeah.